let us move on to the next question let us try to answer this before we explain you are an intern a lot of you are interns right now on emergency night duty that is false you are never on emergency night duty at least not in ophthalmology guys let's assume you are you are an intern on emergency night duty in ophthalmology ward a patient complains of sudden painful loss of vision it becomes an emergency because it is sudden and painful what is the best sign to differentiate acute anterior uveitis from acute angle closure glaucoma so they are not asking you to make the diagnosis they are telling you that severe painful loss of vision can either be an acute anterior uveitis or it can be an acute anti angle closure glaucoma you are an intern on night duty how will you differentiate between the two you will say sir we don't know how to differentiate we will give a call to our seniors he or she will come and do it no but that is not one of the options no so let's see option a option b option c or option d a b c or d a b c d a b c d anybody you can answer this question anybody if you are saying b you are absolutely wrong keratic precipitates but you are saying sir kps are seen in anterior uveitis they are not seen in angle closure glaucoma i know that but how will you see whether the patient has kps or not kps they are not seen on torch light kps can be seen on keratic or oh, sorry kps can be seen on slit lamp they cannot be seen on torch light you don't know how to use a slit lamp am i making myself very clear here yes now you are saying sir we will see meiosis are you saying i know sir we don't know so let us see sir what other option you may have said you may have said circumcorneal congestion circumcorneal congestion is basically redness redness will be there in uveitis as well as glaucoma cannot differentiate wrong answer posterior synechia posterior synechia can be there in uveitis can be there in acute angle closure glaucoma if it is an exacerbation of a long standing glaucoma can not differentiate posterior synechia in acute anterior uveitis can again be a sign of a chronic uveitis patient coming to you in an acute exacerbation both ways either it can be present in both of them not useful what is useful for us is this meiosis why is this useful why is this the answer everybody because we know that in acute anterior uveitis the pupil is meiosed whereas in acute angle closure glaucoma we find a mid dilated pupil so when you just have a torch in your hand the only thing that you can see or you only see you can measure is the size of the pupil everybody and that is why the question is framed in a way which is saying you can also diagnose whether it is a case of anterior uveitis or angle closure glaucoma are we clear about this everybody i hope we are clear if it is a case of angle closure glaucoma your main role will be to reduce the intraocular pressure as quickly as possible by administering either tablet acetazolamide or by administering intravenous mannitol over 330 minutes yes but if it is a case of acute anterior uveitis your main aim is to start steroids heavy dose steroids as soon as possible to control the inflammation which is occurring in the patient's eye all right next question everybody very simple question toric lenses are used to correct so we are talking about here toric lenses so now in optics whenever we have come across the word toric everybody i hope we have learned to associate it with astigmatism or we know toric is basically another name for cylindrical yes or no so at the outset as soon as i read this question there are two options which look likely regular astigmatism or irregular astigmatism now basically the answer has to be amongst the two regular or irregular so please remember irregular astigmatism has no treatment so toric lenses are used for regular astigmatism what is the difference between regular and irregular astigmatism regular astigmatism is when both principal axes are perpendicular to each other means 
इट कैन बी नाइन्टी डिग्री वन एट्टी डिग्री इट कैन बी फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री वन थर्टी फाइव डिग्री इट कैन बी ट्वेंटी डिग्री वन हंड्रेड टेन डिग्री बट वॉट एवर मे बी द केस बोथ दी एक्सिस आर परपेंडिकुलर टू इच अदर इर रेगुलर एस्टिक मैटिजम वेन बोथ एक्सिस आर नॉट परपेंडिकुलर टू इच अदर when they are not perpendicular to each other everybody they usually denote some kind of pathology either a corneal pathology or a lens pathology everybody and that is why we say they don't have any treatment as far as the refractory error or the irregular astigmatism is concerned you have to focus on finding out the cause and treating the cause everybody and then based on that treatment you may or may not be able to correct irregular astigmatism are we pretty clear here here yes or no we are talking about lenses whether that can be iol intraocular lens or it can be a contact lens both lenses intraocular as well as contact lens come or are known as toric lenses all right what is the treatment for press biopia everybody press biopia you need near glasses which are spherical convex everybody yes accommodative inertia accommodative inertia can occur in conditions like spasm of accommodation here we use either a midriatic cycloplegic or some other pharmacological treatment it has nothing to do with any lenticular treatment or spherical or glasses treatment if i can say so okay done now moving on everybody next question steroids may be used in the treatment of which herpetic lesion so when we are talking about herpes basically we are talking about corneal ulcer or we can say we are talking about keratitis when we are reading her corneal ulcer or keratitis almost everywhere we write contraindicated are steroids the question is why do we write contraindicated as steroids if you know this you know the answer steroids are contraindicated in almost all types of corneal ulcer or keratitis because they promote epithelial thinning now in a case of ulcer when i actually need the epithelium to repair itself if it is promoting epithelial thinning it is actually causing the alternate of what i want that is why in all epithelial lesions remember the word steroids are contraindicated in epithelial lesions if you understand this line everybody then this question becomes a cake walk for all of us yes now let us read the options if we know herpes everybody geographic ulcer superficial punctate keratitis dendritic ulcer all these three are epithelial lesions but diskiform keratitis is a stromal lesion or an endothelial lesion all right everybody so can i use steroids in disky form keratitis absolutely yes i can use steroids in disky form keratitis option a b and c are actually progressions of each other so if we see this photograph everybody in the first photograph in photograph a what we see are superficial punctate keratitis everybody yes speak is small small dots scattered all over small dot like lesions then everybody in image b we see what has formed everybody dendrites dendritic ulcer okay and then in the third image we see what has formed geographic ulcer so these are progressions of each other if there was spk and steroids were given everybody it would have led to dendritic in dendritic ulcer if steroids are given everybody then it will lead to geographic all these three are epithelial lesions and all these three lesions the treatment is 3% a cyclovir eye ointment 5 times a day for 10 to 14 days that's the treatment and contraindicated are steroids because these are epithelial lesions i hope we are pretty clear about this there is no confusion in this yes now moving on to the next question an 18 year old undergoes lasik surgery for 6 diopter of myopia all right on the seventh post operative day her iop measured by goldman's aplanation tonometry what would you expect so the question is basically on measurement of iop goldman's aplanation tonometer has been used as all of us may know or may remember goldman's is the gold standard for tonometry 
But even though it is the gold standard, it has a drawback. What is the drawback? It depends on corneal thickness because it is based on Imbert Fick law, which states that the pressure inside a contained sphere is equal to the force applied divided by the area applanated. So, because it depends on the force applied, everybody, force depends upon the corneal thickness. The amount of force needed to flatten the cornea will be more if cornea is thick, will be less if cornea is thin. And that is the basic fundamental or basic drawback of using Goldman's aplanation tonometer in a post LASIK case. In LASIK, what do we do? In LASIK surgery, we photo ablate. Yes or no? It works by photo ablation. Photoablation basically means decreasing the corneal stromal thickness to flatten the cornea. So, we are photoablating to flatten the cornea and when we are photoablating, we are burning the stroma of the cornea. So, uh, we are making the stromal thickness less. In cases of thin cornea, measured IOP is what? See, we are not talking about IOP. IOP will remain as it is. This is an extraocular surgery per se. It is not an intraocular surgery. We are not actually changing the IOP. The question is what will occur to the measured IOP? If the cornea is thin, the force applied will be lesser. If the force applied is lesser to aplanate the cornea, everybody, that means the measured pressure will be lesser. So, our answer will be false low. The measured IOP that will come will be false low, everybody. And that is what the answer is. Option C, false low intraocular pressure. Roughly, everybody, we say in such a case, corrected IOP has to be calculated for which everybody, every 10 micron change in corneal thickness is equal to 1 mm Hg of IOP. Alright everybody and that's your question on corneal thickness and its relation to tonometry. Next question guys, the power of an intraocular lens or IUL should be increased. So cataract surgery is being done, you are calculating the IUL power. Basically that means this question is indirectly on biometry. Now, biometry step 1 everybody depends on corneal curvature or keratometry and step 2 depends on A scan ultrasonography is axial length. Yes, those are the two variables given to you in the options. I hope you understand the question. So, what they are asking you, the power of IOL should be increased. What is the answer according to all of us everybody? Let's see. As the power of cornea increases, if the power of cornea increases to make the eye emetropic, the IUL power should actually decrease. Yes, am I right here? See, I need to make the eye emetropic at last. So, as the corneal power increases to offset that, my IUL power will decrease. So, I know that my corneal power should decrease. That means option A and option C become wrong. This is pretty clear, yes or no? The total power of the eye is power of cornea plus power of lens or in this case power of IOL. All right, everybody. So, if power of cornea increases, IOL has to reduce. Am I making myself very clear here? Now, option B. As the power of the cornea decreases, option D as the power of cornea decreases. This we are a certain of. Now, axial length increases or axial length decreases. So, everybody, if my axial length increases, image will start forming in front of the retina. So, what would I need to do? I will need to diverge it. So, if my axial length is increased, 
आई विल हैव टू डिक्रीज द आई ओ एल पावर बट हेयर द क्वेश्चन इज आई ओ एल पावर हैज टू बी इंक्रीज दैट मीन्स एवरीबडी इफ द एक्जियल लेंथ इज डिक्रीज देन आई विल नीड मोर पावर टू कन्वर्ज इट येस सो आई ओ एल पावर विल इंक्रीज सो द आई ओ एल पावर विल इंक्रीज एज द पावर ऑफ कॉर्निया डिक्रीजेज एंड एज द एक्जियल लेंथ डिक्रीजेस All right. Or if I say in a very simple word, in hypermetropia, power of I is less. Yes. So if in a hypermetropic patient cataract surgery is done, I O L implanted will be of. मोर पावर ये सर आई एम ट्राइंग टू मेक द पेशेंट ई मेट्रोप सो इफ ए पेशेंट वॉज ऑलरेडी हाइपर मेट्रोपिक द पावर ऑफ द आई वॉज लेस सो वेन आई इम्प्लांट एन आई ओ एल आई विल इम्प्लांट एन आई ओ एल ऑफ हायर पावर सो दैट एट लास्ट द पेशेंट बिकम्स ई मेट्रोप नाउ इन हाइपर मेट्रोपी एवरीबडी पावर ऑफ कॉर्निया इज लेस एक्जियल लेंथ इज लेस we could have solved this question any which way everybody the answer is simple the power of cornea and the axial length both will decrease if both are decreased the total power of the eye is less so we need to increase it by implanting i u l of higher power uh moving on to the next question everybody the question is simple false about bitot spots is we have already discussed an image based question on bitot spots so let us say that this is kind of an immediate revision here for you do we remember bitot spots yes we should x1 b everybody what were bitot spots foamy triangular patches on conjunctiva so so i know that they appear on conjunctiva if they are appearing on conjunctiva and i remember the classification i know they are not going to occur on cornea and the answer becomes straight you can answer it here If not, everybody, let us see what are bitot spots. Accumulation of keratinized epithelial cells. Yes or no? Yes. I told you three changes here, everybody. Bitot spots are due to loss of goblet cells. What do we see? We see squamous metaplasia, and we see keratinization. Yes, that is what is actually option A. Keratinized epithelial debris. they appear on conjunctiva yes foamy triangular patches foamy triangular patches most commonly seen on temporal conjunctiva and they will develop into xerophthalmia if not treated obviously we are discussing the xerophthalmic changes yes xerophthalmic fundus that is the last classification so that is a simple question about theoretical question about bitot spots next question everybody source of bleeding in case of high fema due to blunt injury we know in blunt ocular trauma high fema is the most common sign now if high fema is occurring everybody where is the blood accumulating the blood we know is accumulating in the anterior chamber if blood is accumulating in the anterior chamber there are only two structures which are forming the anterior chamber iris posteriorly and cornea anteriorly cornea is a vascular that means the bleeding has to be from iris so the basic simple question is what is the blood supply of iris and the answer is yes circulus iridis major circulus iridis major is a branch of all the branches an estomatic branch of all the branches of long posterior ciliary artery which is a branch of posterior ciliary artery which is a branch of ophthalmic artery and which is the first branch of internal carotid artery as i again always like to say the whole eye is supplied by internal carotid artery except the eyelids eyelids are supplied by external carotid artery system all right Let's move on to the next question, everybody. The next question is: A five-year-old boy presents with five-year-old five-year-old boy presents with severe ptosis associated with poor levator function. Which of the following will be the treatment? So the key here is poor levator function. Why, everybody? 
बिकॉज इफ वी नो दैट देर इज माइल्ड और देर इज मॉडरेट टोसिस देन दिस इज यूजली एसोसिएटेड विथ गुड एल पी एस फंक्शन इवन दो द एल पी एस इज नॉट कंप्लीटली वर्किंग बट स्टिल इट हैज गुड फंक्शन दैट इज वाई द टोसिस हैज नॉट डेवलप्ड सीवियर ओके इन सच केसेज द ट्रीटमेंट इज लीवेटर रिसेक्शन वट डू यू मीन बाय लीवेटर रिसेक्शन रिसेक्ट इज इक्वल टू कट विच इज अ शॉर्टनिंग प्रोसीजर वेन यू शॉर्टन अ मसल यू स्ट्रेंदन अ मसल सो इफ द लीवेटर एक्शन इज गुड If it is still functional, we cut it, we resect it, we make it stronger, and thus we try to solve the problem of ptosis. But if we are talking about severe ptosis, if we are talking about poor levator function, then the answer has to be yes. Everybody, frontalis sling surgery or frontalis suspension surgery. A lot of times you will see only written sling surgery. What is this frontalis sling surgery based on? it is based on the fact that when i look up or when i want my eyelids to move up i can move my eyelids up in two ways number one i use my lps everybody see i'm using my lps and to a certain extent my muller's muscle but now everybody if my lps and muller's are not functioning in my upper eyelid i use my frontalis do you see everybody i use my frontalis when i use my frontalis then also my eyelid moves up so we take a sling we say cut silicon thread we pass it under the screen we make a loop in the upper eyelid and then we tie a knot on the forehead so that the connection between the frontalis and the upper eyelid becomes stronger and now the patient is taught to do this whenever they want to move the upper eyelid up okay this when they do this everybody the upper eyelid will move further up and the totic eyelid will become better it will probably not resolve completely but it will become much better and that is frontalis suspension surgery also remember that fasnella servet operation is done for ptosis in horner's syndrome if horner's syndrome has caused ptosis then we do a surgery called as fasnella servet surgery okay next question everybody glaucoma valve implant is used in which of the following surgery very easy question previous question which has been asked in neat everybody glaucoma valve implant when all the other surgeries have failed we need to go to a crude surgery where we need to put an implant in the anterior chamber for the aqueous to drain this is also known as setons or seton surgery this is a straight name this is an old name seton surgery nowadays the textbooks write glaucoma valve implant but at a lot of places you will still find seton surgery being used